CSB, proud sponsors of About the House. In this week's episode of About the House, we'll be revisiting Graham and Mago, who we saw just over two years ago. Their build was informed by Mago's medical condition, ME, and they were determined to make a healthy house. I've come back to see if they've succeeded. Five years ago, Graham and his wife Mago decided to build a house that was energy efficient, cheap to run and low emissions. And because Mago suffers from ME, it needed to be very healthy. They also decided to manage the build themselves, and this meant things didn't run quite as smoothly as they'd hoped. Graham and Mago first moved to this idyllic spot in the heart of the Wicklow countryside 15 years ago. They were living in London when they first fell in love with it whilst on holiday. But the cottage itself was basically derelict. It was 200 years old and had been uninhabited for over a decade. There were trees growing up the inside like this. Right, right. Pretty and, primitive. And somebody said the only reason the roof was still up was all the woodworm were holding hands, so it was in bits. They decided that their extension and renovation would retain the original cottage. And on our wedding day, we got married here and he carried me over the threshold, so I wasn't going to have that disappear either. Right, <laughs> so it's a lot of memories and attractions. Very, yeah, memories. very much. And of course, building a healthy house was paramount. I found out after being sick that, that the quality of the air is very important. And um, we had lived in mouldy places before. I went in to have my lungs looked at and the, the specialist told me that my lungs look like either an asthma sufferer, which I'm not, or a heavy smoker, which I'm not. So I, I just had this conviction that whatever else happened, I really wanted to live... In a dry house. In a dry house with clean air. And they were also very keen to ensure the house had a low running cost and a minimal impact on the environment. So they were installing a variety of ecological features like solar panels and a wood pellet boiler. But making the decision to manage the bill themselves meant bad things for their budget and their schedule. What about when you're going to move in? How long? About three months. Three months, three yeah. months. we think about three mm. months. And have you got a building schedule? No, I haven't got a building schedule. Right, well, you know, without a building schedule now, it'll be very, very hard to determine whether you're going to be able to get in in three months. No schedule meant even worse things for their budget. And the measures I suggested to enable them to achieve their goal of being healthy and efficient, initially just seemed to add to this. You need a lot more insulation on the walls and the roof than what you're proposing to do. So I would give you some advice on how you could go about that. And also because of your health issues, I'd advise you on a heat recovery ventilation system, having made the house very airtight first, to follow with that. It's good to have advice on it, but it sounds even more complicated than we were already imagining it was going to be. Like the extra insulation all around the inside of the walls, I didn't know we had to do that or that it was a good idea to do that. And I certainly haven't budgeted for it. Um, now the heat recovery um, system sounds like a great idea because if that means we get fresh air, this fresh air, inside the house all day long, winter and summer, that's a brilliant idea. But I didn't budget for it. With budgets already running over, it seemed unlikely that they would incorporate what I'd suggested. But when I came back to visit again a couple of months later, I was surprised to find that they had. We've been able to do what he suggested, which is brilliant because it's a much healthier house as a result. And we've just been a bit more creative about where to save money. You know, future-proofing it and putting in the, all the energy-saving devices, all the air, you know, putting in the heat recovery ventilation, having good quality air and having no mould. There'll never be mould in this house. There can't be, not the way it's built. But whilst they might have been making a completely future-proofed and healthy home, what has this meant for their three-month schedule? 
Okay. Well, Michael Graham, you were hoping to be in by Christmas. It's now getting close to that period. I don't think you're going to make it. We're not going to be in by Christmas. No way. How do you feel about that? I think it's OK. It's fine because, in a way, we've got a kind of a completely different house to what we started out with. And the first time you came down, <laughs> I got a bit depressed because you were talking about a lot of extra things that w w were possibilities for us to do. And we had to make a decision about whether to go that route or not. Because really the house we, we started out with and the house we've ended up with are, are, are quite different. And these delays continued on. It was well after Christmas before Mago and Graham were finally able to move into the house with their family. But now they're finally in their home and they came up to meet them to see how it was performing. Well, Mago, how does it feel like now to be back in the house after all the work you've done here? It's, it's great. The building seemed to go on for a long time. Everything went fine in the end, but it's, it's just a relief to have it over. I was, I was you know, it, it just seemed to go on and on. <laughs> it did go on and on. It was like two years, three years of our lives. So how's the heating system working, Greg? Everybody tells you, get one person to put in your solar, your heating system, and to make sure that they all fit together with your plumbing. And we didn't. We got three different people to do that job. It hasn't worked. It hasn't worked at all. We barely get hot water. The pellet boiler does work, but it was a, it was a prototype. And to be honest, it, you know, I, I spent a lot of time out there just fixing it. The other element that was very important was to have a healthy house. So is the house as healthy now as you thought it would be? I think it is. I think it's, it is healthy. It feels fantastic, yeah. doesn't it? It feels very fresh all the time. It's not like any other house I've, I've ever been in, in the sense that it feels... It feels really healthy. I think, yeah, I think we managed to get that. And there's no sign of mould? No, mo well, I, uh, no, not at all. There's no signs of mould. I don't think there's any mould anywhere in the house. But sometimes, whilst the air might feel clean, in reality, there might be hidden dangers there. And when it's so vital to the health of its occupants, it's important to be sure that the air that we're breathing really is clean. I decided to step in and get some experts up to the house. We're here today from the Health Friendly Air division of the Air Mattel Group. Um, and essentially we're a group that were set up by um, a number of Irish doctors back in 2007. Um, and our mission is essentially to reduce ill health um, as a result of exposures to contaminants in indoor air. Pauline's here today, uh, she's one of our occupational hygienists. Um, so she's one of the scientists that actually come out and do the testing. They conduct a variety of tests to look for any traces of anything harmful in the air, from mould to noxious chemicals. These comprehensive tests then need to be analysed in the health-friendly air lab in order to get accurate results. Immunologist Dr Bruce Mitchell, chairman of this organisation, explained in more detail what it is they do there. The facilities here have been developed over the last three years. We now have laboratories uh, with state-of-the-art capabilities. And the results from the filters on the heat recovery system are pretty concerning for Graham and Mago. First observation that has been made in the Wells House is that there is an increased mould count on the filter. We are growing mould from the filter. Mould can cause health problems for anyone with a weakened immune system or allergies. Prolonged exposure can lead to nasty symptoms, such as bleeding from the lungs and hair loss. However, this is a result of exposure to high levels of mould, and the amounts in Graham's and Maga's house are much below this level. Unfortunately, the reason for them having any mould at all seems to be avoidable. One of the most striking things about the Wells house is, is that that filter has not been changed for almost one year. And of course the recommendation is it should be changed or washed every three months. So it's not the heat recovery system that's at fault, but the way in which it has been maintained. Without a doubt, uh, it's preferable that they have this system in place. So I'm all for having heat recovery, but I'm also all for maintaining it properly, and in particular the filtration systems that are necessary. So this is a problem that can be easily sorted out but unfortunately, it's not the only one. Volatile organic chemicals, it's a 
term that represents thousands and thousands of chemicals that are in our home. In this house, uh, the levels are higher than best practice would recommend. There are a multitude of reasons why this might happen. Culprits range from the paint on our walls to the air fresheners we buy. We really need to start thinking about what we are bringing into our air, our space. And uh, if you have a toxic uh, material present in a cleaning chemical, and you have, a, by contrast, another cleaning chemical that you can use that doesn't have a toxic component, we say you should use the non-toxic one. The other issue for Graham and Mago is their heating system, which is just not functioning at all. After the break, I draft in alternative technology experts Paul Carberry and Joe Carrigan of Renewable Energy Systems to see if there's anything can be done to help them. And Katrina goes back to Graham and Mago's home to give them the bad news about their air. ESB, proud sponsors of About the House. ESB, proud sponsors of About the House. Graham and Mago have been having serious problems with the green technologies they installed in the renovated cottage. I've drafted in ecological technology experts Paul Carberry and Joe Corrigan to see if they can help to sort this out. First they look at the solar hot water system. Where the whole installation got mixed up and, and the householders were involved in, in that whole dilemma that went on, uh, this is not set up properly because it is now running into a much too big a tank. So the tank in this case is probably 400 litres bigger than it should be. It's, it's 40 metres away from where the solar collectors are, which is, in our view, too far. And then it was on to the wood pellet boiler to see what could be done. Well, I suppose really getting down to this boiler, it's one of the early boilers. Things have moved along a long way since uh, the time this boiler was installed. And we now have a whole new uh, generation, if you like, of, of more efficient, uh, more user-friendly boilers. Paul and Joe now need to analyse their findings to make sure they come up with the best possible solutions for Graham and Mago. But there's another issue that becomes obvious when Paul and Joe inspect the boiler. OK, this is what we call clinker, and this is actually coming from the wood pellets themselves. So um, instead of where you would normally find some ash, some clean ash, that would run down through the grate and be in the grate of the boiler, or down underneath the grate of the boiler, this is above the grate. Um, and this is a hard, solid mass, and it will eventually stop the boiler igniting. That can be quite easily rectified by just uh, ensuring that you buy your, your wood pellets off the right supplier and also interestingly new standards that are coming in now to ensure that this doesn't happen in the future. Wood fuel is meant to be the most cost effective and efficient form of heating fuel. I wanted to find out more about this worrying issue and went to meet Richard Hadfield from the National Standards Authority of Ireland to find out what was being done about it. Richard, wood fuel is an important fuel and we're burning a lot more of it now than we have been. Are there problems with the actual fuels themselves? Yes, the, I think the problem we have right now is there are so many people producing fuel on the market that, and the quality is so variable that the consumer can, by chance, get a, something there that they didn't expect. The commonest problem is moisture content and that is when wood is sold too young, basically. How serious is that? What, how can that affect the fuel? It can be very serious because there has been fuel on the forecourt, say, of a, of a garage, which has just been freshly cut down and may contain 50% uh, moisture content. And what that really means in a 12 kilogram bag of logs, you're buying six kilograms of water and six kilograms of wood. And of course, when you burn wood like that, that's 50% moisture content, the wood is basically driving off the moisture. It's not heating your home. What are the other issues now besides moisture content? You may not know where it comes from for a start. Um, some of it may be recycled. 
Um, it could be in a pallet in its former life, and that pallet could be treated with chemicals. Um, it could have paint on it, uh, maybe flakes of paint, which obviously is not what you want to have in your, your grate. Um, nails and other things like that. So basically, it's foreign, foreign material that you didn't intend buying. But now, the NSAI are bringing in new standards, which will ensure that the wood fuels that have been certified will be fit for purpose. The problems of wet logs and clinker in your boiler will hopefully be a thing of the past. Every type of wood fuel is being covered under this programme, from wood pellets to logs, from wood chips to wood briquettes. I asked what tests they are actually running to ensure wood fuel will meet their criteria. We first of all visit the supplier and we look at the way they are actually producing the wood fuel. All the fuel is tested and we have Waterford Institute of Technology do all testing of the fuels uh, at least once a year, but for bigger suppliers this is more regular and they test against all the criteria that are in NSAI standard. So thanks to these new stringent conditions, wood fuel problems for a person with a wood burning boiler like Graham should be a thing of the past. Back at Graham and Mago's house, RES had finished their tests and Paul explained the problems to Mago that they'd found with the heating system before suggesting some solutions. We can quite simply now uh, take those collectors on a much shorter pipe run into an in-house domestic hot water tank. Basically involves putting in a tank, a 300 litre tank, yeah. removing the pump station and all of the equipment from the boiler house at the other end of the house and bringing it in-house here. Uh, it sounds a bit disruptive, yeah, because <laughs> <laughs> the only place I can imagine any of that happening is in the laundry, and I've fought for my laundry for years, but yeah. um, we'll see. Okay. But Mago seemed more enthusiastic about Paul's suggestions for the boiler. One of our ideas would be to look at, at the boiler and possibly, I don't know how it would go down with you, look at, at changing out that boiler for one of the more modern, up-to-date boilers. We would look at a, a burner that would burn both logs and wood pellets, a combination boiler. How would you feel about something like that? Well, it sounds brilliant to be able to burn logs because they're you know, in reasonably priced supply, if not free supply, because of where we live. Whilst they mull over whether or not they want to take Paul and Joe's advice, yeah, so. Katrina arrives with the bad news about their air test results. Probably the most significant finding um, is that we found a elevated uh, level of mould in the heat recovery ventilation system. Uh, and we found that the levels of mould were, were really quite high. Then we came into the house and we took air samples mm -hmm. um, to see whether or not that colonisation was being pushed into the house through yes. the ductwork. Yes. And it was. Chronic exposure over time um, will increase the probability of ill health. Um, so the key here is to get rid of the mould. How, well, can you just tell me how it got there in the first place? Where is it coming from? Yeah, I mean, basically Ireland and, and, and mould kind of go hand in hand. So we've got a very damp atmosphere. An annual change out of the filters, you know, that's not enough. The other parameter that we found that was like a little bit elevated was chemicals. Inside, you need to take a look at what you're using. So kind of a full kind of inventory of what cleaning products are you using. I um, use every type of cleaning product on yeah, the market. I yeah. miss the cleaning products. Really? I love cleaning yeah, products. That... I'm actually quite shocked, to tell you the truth. I'm, um, I think I'm a bit cross too, because I think I've gone and put all this effort into trying to eradicate, um, eradicate, you know, mold. That was my primary. That was enemy number one was mold. I didn't want to have mold in the house, and now I've got mold. I've got a lot of mold. <laughs> I'm furious. And Mago, I don't know. It's, I, I'm gonna have to let her tell Mago. I don't want to tell her. Yeah, I'm worried about the chemicals. Um, I'm worried about being the cause of the chemicals, actually. I am definitely going to take that advice. I'm going to get rid of all cleaning products, vanished, they're gone. It's a new world, new world order. I'm going to get rid of the cleaning products. I'm going to get the filter. I started out looking at this house for being for air quality. Priority number one was air quality. And if I haven't got that, I've failed. Air quality is something we all need to be aware of. We can create mould in our homes ourselves by high humidity and condensation through a lack of ventilation or proper insulation. We also need to worry about the other dangerous contaminants that can be present in our homes, like cigarette smoke, 
radon and carbon monoxide. In Green Anne, Mango and Graham decided to take the advice on their heating system, despite Mango's initial reservations. They're getting a new boiler and a smaller buffer tank, which they're putting inside. Paul and Joe set about implementing these changes. I paid one last visit to Graham to see whether they'd finally been able to achieve the healthy, fully functioning house they wanted. So is your heating system all sorted out now? It is. Uh, the good thing about having Joe and Paul was they, they sort of like filled that void, that gap we didn't have before. They were like, they really know what they're talking about. And they've explained the whole system to me. And for the first time, I think I actually get it, you know, the, the way it's supposed to work. Now we've got one person who's overseeing the whole system. So we've kind of been able to go back in time and put that right, if you like. So I'm delighted about that. If you hadn't come back, to be honest, we'd probably be sitting there looking at the wood boiler, wondering, taking bets with locals on how long it was going to run. So at last, Graham and Mago have the home that they've always dreamt of. They've retained the stone structure of their original cottage, whilst simultaneously turning it into a beautiful, efficient and healthy home for them and their family. The best thing for me about it actually is being able to move away and come back here with our kids, you know, and, and turn this into a, a family home. We were home for a weekend from London and how long ago? 15, 15 years ago. Years and we ago. stood on that bridge and saw this little house for sale and it was very tumble down and it was in bits, wasn't yeah, it? It was, it was yeah. ivy growing in the inside of it. Yeah. But it just called to us. It's always been a lovely piece of land. The estate agent said, don't buy don't it. Buy it yeah. Don't buy it. The estate agent says, don't buy it. It's too much work to be done to it. Yeah. But we lived in it with the drips and the outside bathroom and it's, it's like magic to stand there and, and now see that it's a, it's a healthy home and we have our kids here and they love it, they love the space and the garden and we walk all the time. And it's a fantastic area and the people around here are terrific, they're lovely, lovely people so it's a really great community. Next week, I'm revisiting architect Cottle Stevens and his wife Sarah in Donegal to see how their ambitious Passive House standard restoration of a 200-year-old cottage turned out. And I follow a house renovation in Dublin that shows how you can make your home energy efficient and modern without having to invest so much money or time. ESB, proud sponsors of About the House.